Hello, this is Eric Miller, and this presentation will be over the relationship between slavery and the global economy. If we step back and look at the bigger picture, we can see that slaves do support the global economy, first through slaveholders, which compete with themselves all over countries where slavery exists, which help support their own local economies. And this support of those local economies, because of how the global economy today is so intertwined with everything that goes on within it, these small contributions that individual slaves make do add up and support the full global economy. And we will be looking at each of these subdivisions in more detail next. The most common way that slaves are enslaved today is through things called debt bondage and contract slavery. And this involves placing the slaves in some kind of debt, usually with a high enough interest that the slaves can never actually escape that debt and are forced to work for the holder of that debt for a very long time, usually their entire lives. In Thailand, uh, small girls from northern poorer villages are enslaved, and the pimps that purchase these female slaves to later be prostitutes will pay these families in advance on what he expects to make from the girl, usually of about $2,000, which is roughly equal to the yearly earnings of a typical Thailand farmer. And the girl is told she must pay back this debt through prostitution. And it is the pimp that decides when this slave is free from her duties. Usually this is when that slave is of no further use to him. In Brazil, workers or potential workers are offered a job out in the jungle where they will spend time making charcoal. What they don't know is that once they arrive here, they are told that they owe the owner money for transporting them and paying for their food along their way and for the food they will be eating at the camp. And they're paid consistently $280 per month. And most of them do try to pay off this debt and the ones that would like to run away usually can't because once they arrive at these camps, they have their IDs and their workers' cards taken away from them. So their quality of life would be lower outside the camps because of their inability to find any further work. In Pakistan, oftentimes a person's debt already exists because they either inherit it from their father or husband when the husband passes away. But some slaves do acquire debt when they choose to work for these uh, landlords or kiln owners making bricks. And they make bricks at a rate of 1,000 bricks per day and are paid $2 for each 1,000 bricks that they produce. The problem with this, though, is that the cost to actually stay alive in Pakistan is $2 per day. Sometimes they are able to get ahead of their debt, but if there is ever a problem in the family, they will immediately fall behind, having to borrow money from their master, continue buying food, medicine. But in any case, it's very difficult to get out of this state of slavery. In India and Mauritania, the situation with slavery is a bit different. It's closer to chattel slavery, where masters own several slaves. In India, there is a debt, but this debt is never paid off, and oftentimes slaves are born in debt and know they will be in debt until they die. And now we're going to take a closer look at slaveholders or slave owners who view slavery as either a requirement to be competitive or a very big incentive to make much higher profit margins on their investments. In Brazil, slaveholders are paid by the company that owns the batteries they run to produce charcoal based on the profit margins they make at that 
battery. And because most slaveholders in the area do take part in slavery, any slaveholder that does not use slavery to get an edge usually just goes out of business or isn't paid enough to bother being a manager. In Pakistan, brick making is very competitive, and because of the high supply of bricks, slaveholders can only sell those 1,000 bricks a slave family can make in a day for about $20. Running the kiln, however, means that producing those 1,000 bricks from start to finish is going to cost the kiln owner about $18, meaning he's only making a $2 profit margin on his investments, which often means that if a kiln owner pays regular wage rates for their slaves or to workers, he will quickly go out of business because he's not making any profit. In Mauritania, the most common use for a slave, the most common job a slave would own, is distributing water to households that do not get plumbing supplied to them. And slaveholders here can easily make, as you can see from this chart here, about eight to one hundred and twenty eight dollars a month, even though keeping the slave alive only costs them thirty five dollars a month. In Thailand, the place that probably has the largest profit margin on their investments in slaves, uh, a slave, a brothel can easily expect to make as you can see from this chart, over 800% return on their investments. Now, this brings us to local economies. We see that in Brazil, this cheap car charcoal supplied by underpaying the workers can supply uh, steel mills in the country very cheaply which allows Brazil to become an exporter of very cheap steel. In Pakistan, of course, we get a very cheap supply of bricks. And a subtle effect we see in India is the use of slaves in farming helps cut down on food costs to the rest of the country, which in turn lowers the cost of living in India. And this, finally, brings us to the global economy. Because of the way slavery lowers the cost of labor and provides cheaper goods to the immediate area where slavery exists, slavery can create cheaper goods everywhere. In India, for example, the cheaper food, which results in cheaper a cheaper cost of living, workers don't require as much wage to work. And they produce cheaper goods, which come straight to whatever country is ordering from India. The cheaper steel that is produced in Brazil as a result of slavery can easily wind up in any person's car. And because of this, because of the way all of these goods benefit or become cheaper because of slavery, to some extent we all support slavery. And the only way we're ever going to end slavery is by attacking the slaveholders' profit margins. If slavery is not profitable, the slaveholders will walk away from the business entirely. Businesses began practicing slavery as a result of its profitability, and if it becomes more profitable to turn away from slavery, businesses will do this on their own. Thank you for listening to this presentation.